would like to have our next speaker come up, Mr. Stephen Moore. He's going to talk about Trumponomics and how it's working. Stephen Moore is a, uh, an expert that's in Washington. He formerly wrote on the economy and public policy, policy for the Wall Street Journal and is a distinguished visiting fellow for the Project for Economic Growth at the Heritage Foundation. Mr. Moore, who was also the member of or a member of the journal's editorial board, returned to Heritage in January of 2014, about 25 years after his tenure as the leading conservative think tank's Grover M. Herman Fellow in Budgetary Affairs from 1984 to 1987. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Steve Moore. Thank you, my friend. Good afternoon, my friends. Great to be here. I am no longer a nominee for the Federal Reserve Board, so now I can tell you what I really think. <laughs> so it's a, it's a great uh, privilege to be here, and um, thank you very much. So I want to um, talk a little bit about Trumponomics. I want to talk a little bit about what's going on with the situation with trade, a little bit about Fed policy, because I have some controversial views there, and um, I'll try to get through as much of this as I can. Let me just say one thing about tr Trump. I like to, whenever I give a talk about uh, this book that I wrote, Trumponomics, I like to take the temperature of a room, so I want your honest opinion. Don't give me the, uh, the answer you think I want. Just, I, I truly want to take the, you know, just get a good gauge of the attitudes of, of, of you all in this room. So the question is this. How many of you in this room have a positive opinion of Donald Trump? Raise your hand. Wow. Wow. About two-thirds. How many of you have a negative opinion of Donald Trump? About maybe a little less than a third. <laughs> and this gentleman has two hands up. And how many of you have a less positive opinion of Donald Trump today than you did a week ago before the stock market fell by 1,000 points? So uh, I'll, t I'll say one thing about Donald Trump. Um, he is, uh, he is one of the most unusual politicians that I've ever met in my lifetime. Most politicians that you're around, uh, and I've been around politicians my entire life, probably 35 years, the vast, vast majority, I'd say 90% of politicians you're going to meet are absolutely the most wonderful people you'll ever meet in public and jerks in private. Trump is a jerk in public and a wonderful person in private. He's exactly the opposite of most politicians. Uh, but he is a good guy, and I like, I like what he's doing with the economy a lot. I'm kind of the bull here today. I'm very optimistic about the direction of the economy because I think we've just we put in place a lot of good policies notwithstanding the trade war. So I'm going to kind of very quickly run you through you know, why we've done what we did. I was, uh, I was uh, honored enough to be one of the senior economics advisors for the campaign. I still talk to the president uh, quite often. And by the way, my partner in crime in all of this was uh, Larry Kudlow. How cool is it that Larry Kudlow is the most important economist in the world today? So he's doing an amazing job. So let me run you through a little bit about this. Uh, why did Trump win? Um, because the economy, we didn't have much of a recovery under Obama. I think Obama did the best he could, but what you can see here, by the way, I see a lot of you taking pictures of these slides. I'm happy to make them available to anyone who wants them uh, if you'd like. But what this is showing is just like when you come out of recovery, uh, uh, recession, how fast does the economy grow? And you can see what we had under, under Obama. We did have recovery. By the way, the recovery began in June of 2009, shortly after uh, Obama was, was elected. And this is now you know, a couple of weeks from June of 2019. So this this recovery will be officially 10 years old. That's a that's a long and durable recovery, and I think Obama deserves some credit for that. But it was a weak recovery, and you can see here. You know, I'm just comparing Obama's record with the light blue line as the average recovery because we had nine recessions since the end of World War II, and you can see that the uh, the recovery was substantially the average recovery was substantially stronger than what happened under Obama, twice as fast. Uh, amount of growth in the first seven years. And then I like to compare Obama's recovery with Reagan's recovery, because Reagan and Obama obviously had very opposite uh, approaches to how to deal with, a, with a, an economy. You know, Reagan was, uh, you know, the government is not the solution, government is the problem. Obama was, you know, we have these loads of government solutions to deal with the problem, and you can see the economy grew about two, two and a half times faster under Reagan. So what, what this created was a growth deficit, and that's what the country was suffering from from the, the last two years of Bush Bush's disastrous two years in office, his last two years, and then Obama's years, which weren't too good either. And you can see that the economy
economy would be about $3 trillion larger today if we had had an average recovery. And I would submit to you that's the, the reason Trump won. You know, I would travel with Trump around the country. We'd go to Ohio and Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin and West Virginia and Kentucky, and we'd ask voters there, how's that Obama recovery going for you? And you know what people in these states would say? What recovery are you talking about? Because then there, there were whole amounts of, uh, you know, whole areas of the country that just didn't feel recovery at all and were left behind. If you lived in Hollywood, or if you lived in Silicon Valley, or if you lived in uh, Wall Street, um, or if you lived in Washington, D.C., you know, the economy was booming, but not so much in a lot of other areas. And I think that's why the voters took this, this uh, kind of risk in, in uh, voting for Trump uh, into office. So. Uh, the second point is, well, you've heard a lot about the debt. You've heard some of the previous speakers talk about the debt. Obviously, everybody's concerned about our national debt. This is, the, I think, the best way to measure the debt. The debt is a share of our GDP. Is it a problem now? Well, it's doubled over the last 10 years, so that's certainly a dismal record. But I would say even at 80% of GDP, where we are now, it's not a crisis. It's a problem. It's not a crisis. But the crisis comes if we see, as you can see, if we stay on the path that we've been on. And this is, as all of you know, this is being driven by demographics. 10,000 baby boomers are retiring every single day. Fewer and fewer Americans are entering the workforce, and that means we've got a demographic situation where we just have too many people retired and too few people working to support them, and you can see the projections. By the way, we've known for 40 years this Titanic has been headed to this iceberg, and the politicians did nothing about it, and now we're getting perilously close to that iceberg. And so that's a big problem, but the other problem, by the way, this is the reason we need more legal immigration, because we we need more workers in this country. But the other problem was, of course, that, uh, that the growth rate that is being projected by the official forecasters in Washington at the Congressional Budget Office and the Social Security trustees and so on, they're, uh, they're anticipating the U.S. economy will grow 1.8 to 1.9 percent for the next 25 years. And when Larry and I took this chart to Donald Trump, we said, you know, and he, he agreed that the hell no, we're America. We're not going to grow 1.8 or 1.9 percent. I don't care what Larry Summers says. There is no secular stagnation. There's no reason the U.S. economy can't grow at a much faster pace. And we said, you know, we think the economy could grow at about a three and a quarter pace. And we even said to Trump, you know, we think we could, if you really do all the right things, we can get you to 4% in, in, in you know, classic Trump terms. I want five, I want 5% growth. I don't know if we can get five, but I, I, know, I do know we're at 3% growth now for the past five quarters. That's something almost nobody said was possible, and yet we've got it. And you can see if we stay on that three, the three and a half percent growth path, the blue line shows you that our debt as a share of GDP falls. It doesn't rise. And so the crisis can be largely averted by a faster economic growth. And this is, by the way, the central tenet of Trumponomics. It's grow, 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 grow. Whatever the problem is, grow the economy faster. You'll get a better stock market. You'll have less income, you'll have less income inequality. You'll have less poverty. You'll help solve the problems of the cities, you'll reduce the deficit and that and so on. So growth is everything is sort of one of the overriding uh, factors behind Trumponomics. Now, um, I, there's a big story that, that kind of one of the stories lines of this conference already, it's just getting started, is, is this bull market that we've been in over the last seven or eight years, is it coming to an end? And you can see, I like to show this chart. This is the uh, S&P 500 over the last 50 years or so. And you can see, by the way, the green line is the S&P 500 adjusted for inflation. So you all know when you make an investment, hopefully you all know this, when you make an investment, you're interested in your after inflation, not your before inflation rate of return. And what's interesting about this chart, a lot of people aren't familiar with it. You can see what happened in the 1970s when we, how many are old enough to remember 14% inflation and 20% mortgage interest rates and so on? It, the, the 1970s was the worst debt decade for returns on equity since the Great Depression. Stocks lost 60% of their value from 1969 through 1982 because inflation and high tax rates just eroded the, the value of the American economy. And you can see what happened, um, you know, the way I like to put this, if you look at that blue line again and you can see the steep ascent, you know, what happened was, I'm a little bit biased, but I'll simply say it, the clouds dispersed, the sun started shining, and God gave America Ronald Reagan, right? And it made a big, big, big difference. We reduced taxes, reduced regulation, we got inflation under control by controlling the money supply, and the, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make here is if you look at that ascent, ladies and gentlemen, that, that growth, that huge increase in, in the uh, value of equities, the Dow Jones, by the way, anybody know that the Dow Jones hit its low point end in the summer of 1982? If anybody knows, shout it out. Who said that? 
You are exactly right, sir. 777. And then, whoops, I just spilled a lot all over me. Whoops. I did not wet my pants. <laughs> anyway, uh, yes, you're exactly right. 777. And what was it? You know, uh, some 20 years later, wasn't that 777? It was, you know, about 10, 11,000. That's a bull market, right? That's a bull market. And what I'm trying to tell you here is now look at what happened um, since, since the bottoming out of the 2009. Uh, recession, you can see, yeah, we've had a nice run up in stocks, no question about it. And the question is, is this coming to an end? And, and my point is, no, look, if you look at that, that bull market we had from 82 to 2000, that added 18 years. We're only nine or 10 years into this. So my point is, look, bull markets don't, don't end, they, they're, they don't die of exhaustion. They die from policy mistakes. I can, you look over the last 50 years, and I can point to the policy mistake that led to the bull market coming to an end. Now, what policy mistakes are we seeing now? I, look, I do think the trade thing is very dangerous, and so that's, that's one thing we have to look out for. But if we can get this trade deal done with China, you've got lower taxes, less regulations, low interest rates, you've got a pro-business president, <laughs> the economy can continue to soar, and so, so will the stock market, in my opinion. In other words, I think this bull market easily has seven or eight more years to go. Um, you know, I just thought this was interesting. Somebody brought up Japan earlier, and he was so right. that. Re do you all remember when Japan was going to, remember that? Japan's going to overtake the United States. You know, their economy is booming. You all remember that? And it's like Japan's going to be the new rising power. That was said in the late 1970s, early 80s. Look at, look at over the last 20 years. The blue line is the U.S. stock market. The red line is the Japanese stock market. Uh, the expert didn't have it quite right, did they? And the reason I show you that, by the way, is this is exactly what people are saying about China today. They're saying, oh my God, China's going up like this. They're going to overtake the United States. You know, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. China is more and more centrally planned. I think their model is going to implode on them. I think China's a bubble. And I'm just not worried about the United States overtaking us, in part because our Chinese are so much smarter than their Chinese. Right? So, you know, I, ju I just don't buy, I don't buy the idea that China's going to overtake us. Now, to the, quickly, on the Fed, and this is important. This is... You know, this was the controversial view that I had that, that kind of led to my downfall, but the point is that I was right. And I, by the way, not just me, but a lot of other people were saying the same thing. This is important that you understand the story of what happened over the last six months. So what you're looking at here is the red line is the, C, is the commodity index, CRB index. I like looking up commodities. By the way, commodities are the best single forward-looking indicator of where inflation is headed. You can, every, I can see virtually everybody in this room has a cell phone with you. You can go on your cell phone right now, right now, and it will tell you within two minutes of what the commodity price index is. So it's a real-time indicator of where prices are headed. Commodity prices, we don't know those for four months. C, G, you know, GDP, we don't know that for five or six months afterwards. C, the, the commodities are a great index because you know what they are instantly. They're the canary in the coal mine. So I, this was my big thing, is we should be looking at commodities as, a, as the measure of where inflation is headed. It's not perfect. We should be looking at other things besides commodities, but commodities are a pretty darn good measure. And my point is, the reason I was hypercritical of the Fed rate increases in September, in September they made a mistake in raising interest rates, and in December, remember what happened on December 18th? How, do you, how many of you remember what they did on December 18th? If you don't remember that, you should, because I, I called it this back then, and I'll say it again, it was one of the greatest acts of economic malpractice in recent times. The Fed was completely out of line in raising interest rates because there was no sign of inflation. Why would you raise interest rates if there's no inflation? If somebody has an answer to that, I, you know, I'd love to hear it. And they say, oh, well, they have to normalize interest rates. I don't even know what that means. I've, I've heard this story, you know, term already 15 times a day. We have to normalize interest rates. What the hell does that mean? What is a normalized interest rate? I have no idea what it means. Every time is different from, uh, from what it was before. And you can see what happened when the Fed started raising rates. Look what happened to the commodity index. It fell and fell and fell and fell and fell. Ladies and gentlemen, that's deflation. When you've got all commodities, everything from lead to oil to cotton to copper to, to wheat falling in prices, that's an indication that the money is too tight. And my criticism is there is absolutely no case for raising interest rate when you have commodity prices falling. And thankfully, thankfully, in early January, Jerome Powell had to put his tail between his legs, remember? And he had to do something that was very embarrassing to him. He had to admit he made a mistake. 
And boy, did he make a mistake. And they finally said, we're, we're not going to be raising interest rates in 2019. And what's happened to the stock market ever since until the last week? Up, 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 up. So the Fed can make major mistakes. My point is to you today, the Fed is still too tight. The Fed is still too How many of you agree with me on that? The Fed is still too tight. I really believe it. Maybe about half of you raise your hands. Um, I think commodity prices are still too low. I would, I would cancel the, the rate increase of December. I would cancel that and go back. Now, Trump wants a one percentage point reduction in rates. I wouldn't do that, but I would cancel the rate increase. And, and by the way, all we have to do going forward, look, economics is so freaking simple. You know, this is why nobody wanted me on the Federal Reserve Board, right? Because I understand this stuff is so simple. All you have to do is keep sta prices stable. That's all the Fed has to do. It just should, should monitor the prices and keep them stable. And if you've got a stable price system on top of tax cuts, you know, uh, lower regulation, pro-business policies, you're going to do just fine. And so uh, that's the mistake that, that the Fed made. And by the way, I do think that the person who will take the spot I was supposed to have believes, as I do, that, that uh, we should be looking at prices, not, uh, not, uh, not uh, interest rates. Um, is there a Trump effect from this boom? Look, this is the best economy in 20 years. It's, you know, until last week, it, it was, you know, incredibly great, great, uh, great uh, stock market. And by the way, for the labor, in terms of labor market, this is the single best labor market for somebody looking for a job since the Beatles were still playing together. That's pretty amazing. I mean, for most of our lifetime, we've never had a labor market so good. This is a beautiful picture on the U.S. economy right now. There, according to the latest labor market report, there are something like 7.2, 7.3 million unfilled jobs. 7.3 million unfilled jobs. That's more unfilled jobs than the entire population of the state of Indiana. And at the same time, there are less than 6 million people unemployed. Think about that. Even if we put every single unemployed American who's looking for a job into a job, we'd still have a million and a half jobs left over. That's how good this economy is right now. The single biggest complaint that I hear from businessmen and women around the country, and I go from everywhere from Portland, Oregon to Portland, Maine, what do you think their single biggest complaint is? They can't find workers. And that has led to a wonderful situation for workers because they can bid up their wages. Donald Trump is the middle class president. That's what he cares about. He cares about blue collar workers. He cares about steel workers. And he cares about truck drivers. And he cares about auto workers. He cares about people who are working with their hands, not just people in investment. And he always, every decision we ever made with him, he was always, how is this going to affect middle class people? How is it going to bring up wages for the middle class? Well, look at this. Is there a Trump effect on the economy? You know, it's so interesting because, uh, you know, until about uh, a month ago, I was with fake news. I was with CNN. And so I would debate all these, you know, liberals, uh, you know, economists, and they're having a hard time explaining the Trump economy, right? I mean, they, I, I feel for them. These are the same people, you all remember this, if Donald Trump is elected president, we're going to have a second Great Depression. Remember that? He is going to bring the economy to its knees. Well, now we have the best economy in 20 years, and they're having a hard time explaining how the president was going to create a depression is now booming the economy. So, you know, what is the latest line? Have you heard this? It's the Obama. It's just Obama has created this economy. And so somebody asked me the other day um, on, uh, you know, this was about a month ago on CNN, because this is what the woman said, it's just Obama. And I said, she said, do you think that five minutes, I got like at least, give me five more minutes, please. Uh, anyway, so she says, do you think that this is Steve? You know, we got this great jobs report. We got this great economy. Do you think that this is just the Obama effect? And I said, absolutely, this is the Obama effect. It's the effect that Barack Obama is no longer president of the United States. That's why the economy is doing so well. Now, look, I, by the way, I'm not here. Honestly, I'm not here, to, I'm not here to criticize President Obama. He did, he, I mean, you know, I, th I, I think he did the best that he could, and I, I think some of his ideas were wrong, but I, I respect the man greatly. But look, look, just look, is there, a, is there a Trump effect? Look at this, small business optimism went through the roof, you know, after the election, consumer confidence went through the roof. Here's my favorite one, today, so, well, go back before the election. About th between three and four uh, Americans rated the economy as good or great. About 35%. Anybody know what that number is today? 
72 percent of Americans rate the economy as good or great. And they're right. It is a good economy. Um, how did it happen? We reduced regulations. I love this. This is my favorite Time magazine of all time, uh, how Trump's cabinet is dismantling government as we know it. This is supposed to be a criticism. Hell yes, he's dismantling government as we know it. That's why we elected the guy, right? I mean, come on. These guys are not very smart. Okay, on trade, quickly. Um, this is the last point I'll make because I'm running out of time. But this is the most important point. So. I hate tariffs. I think most of us in this room are free traders. We understand free trade is one of the pillars of prosperity. Uh, you know, we got the regulations right. We got the taxes down. We've got, uh, you know, uh, sound money, even with some of the mistakes the Fed is making. You know, we've got a pretty good monetary policy. There's no runaway inflation like we had in the 1970s. So there, the errors that we're talking about the Fed making are not major errors. Uh, free trade is the fourth pillar of prosperity. And you want low tariffs because trade, when two people or two countries trade with each other voluntarily, by definition, they're both better, better off, right? That's what trade is about. So Trump has come along with this new doctrine on trade, and Trump is not a conventional free trader by any, me any stretch of the imagination. In fact, I would say he kind of leans in the protectionist uh, direction. But when Larry Kudlow and I used to talk about Trump, and still to this day, he'd say, look, I believe in fr free trade, but I want to make sure that it's fair trade. And he would say, I want to make sure that we have a level playing field, that these other countries are playing by the same rules. We have trade deals with most of these countries, right? The trade deals are, you know, we're supposed to levelize tariffs. Uh, just give me two more minutes because this is important. Um, so, we, you know, we, we, have, um, we have a level playing field. And, uh, and so Trump said, just, just ask us, he said, just look at the data and see if, see if you think it's correct. And, and we looked at the data, and to some extent, Trump is right. We do have lower tariffs than most of these other countries. Our tariff is about one-third. You know, well, Canada and Mexico have, you know, because of NAFTA, which, by the way, was a good deal. I don't agree with Trump on that. But here's the thing. Trump, look at China. Their, tra their tariffs are about three times higher than ours are. That is not a level playing field. Uh, think, by, by the way, their, their, their non-tariff trade barriers are much worse. I talk, again, to businessmen and women around the country. They say it's almost impossible now to do business in China because you have to give up your intellectual property, you have to give up ownership of your company, they steal things, da 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 This is a problem. How many of you agree Donald Trump has identified a major problem in China? How many of you would agree with that? You know, I'm in total agreement with him. Uh, we are, uh, the way I like to put it is, we are in an abusive relationship, right? It's an abusive relationship, and all the abusive, uh, you know, behavior is going on in Beijing. And finally, we have a president, in my opinion, who is standing up to Beijing and saying there's a new sheriff in town, and that these old rules will not stand. Now, this is a dangerous game. This is a dangerous game. I, the last thing we want is a tit-for-tat trade war. That will ruin the market. So it is risky, but I would submit to you two things. One is what other alternative do we have right now, frankly? You know, what, how else are we going to bring an economy? By the way, China is no longer a friend or an, or an ally. They are an enemy. They are an enemy and they're an adversary. You can see that in their, in their behavior every single day. Not only are they stealing $300 billion of our technology every year in terms of our intellectual property, they're also involved in cyber espionage against the United States. They're hacking into our computer systems. That's not the behavior of friendly power. So what Trump has basically said is, you have got to change your behavior. We're going to club you with this 25% tariff. Now, I hate tariffs. But I'm going, to, I'm going to sort of end this on a, on a kind of optimistic note. I think Donald Trump is going to win. I don't, know if it's, I don't know if he's going to win in the next two days or two weeks or two months. I do think there's a high probability that before the end of this year, we will have a new trade deal with China, and they will open up their markets to the United States. They will stand down. They will, there will be greater protection of intellectual property. And by the way, if I am right about that, and I would put the probability at 60 to 65 percent, guess what? We ratchet down tariffs, and we would actually end up with freer trade, not less free trade. And if I'm right about that, if you think this economy is good right now, Wait till we get a good trade deal with China. You ain't seen nothing yet. Thank you very much, folks. Pleasure to be with you.